Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Pei Song. And um, I'm not sure how many of you are coming here for domain-driven design. Actually, uh, I just started the title without thinking about it. <laughs> so I'm not an expert. But after I read a, a few articles about uh, domain-driven design, I think there is something we can uh, share. Even if we do not apply domain-driven design, we are actually using it every day. So we can think about how we can learn from it and apply uh, some of the concepts to our project. Uh, first about myself, uh, I have been developing software for more than 10 years, like uh, server side for 10 plus years, I was three years and one year for uh, web development. Right now I'm starting, I'm doing my own project, it's called uh, REST Studio. Uh, later I can give you an introduction of that. Okay, so even we do not know what exactly is uh, domain-driven design, we can figure out from the uh, name that it's about maintain model and data integrity. Because in a way, when we talk about software, we are talking about input and output, right? Uh, everything is data. So um, <clears throat> we can take a look at the Wikipedia definition of the DDD. Uh, DDD is an approach to software development for complex needs by connecting the implementation to an involving model. Here, involving model means the, mo the model could be changed with the time. And why here it's for complex needs? I will talk, uh, talk about this later. Uh, here are some basic concept of DDD. When we are talking about <coughs> context, of course everyone knows uh, we have context even for our program, programming languages. So it's uh, the setting in which a word or statement appears to determine its meaning. For example, when we are talking about a client object, it means different in billing system and authentication system. In authentication, you just give the uh, username and password. But if it's in the billing system, you have to provide the address as well and something else. So if a developer from a billing team talking to a developer from authentication team, they can get confused because they are working on different contexts. Next is domain. Of course, everyone knows domain means uh, different areas of this project what it is in the real world, right? For example, it's a financial domain or HR domain, okay. Next model, <coughs> uh, a system of abstraction that describes selected aspects of a domain and can be used to solve problems related to that domain. But for us developers, model means schema actually. But for the domain ex expert, it means um, the real world object. So for simplicity, uh, when we talk about model today, I'm talking about schema. Next is the ubiquitous language, a language structured around the domain model and used by all the all team members to connect all the activities of the team with the software. Actually, I think everyone knows UML, or internal uh, development team you can use like uh, protobuf. It's also a language actually. We use JSON as well, XML as well, as, well, uh, as long as everyone in the team understand the language. Okay, here's an example of context. So we have payment system, we have merchant service and accounting service. In each context, we could find the same name, uh, the same uh, the object with the same name, but they actually mean different. Another thing is uh, TDD building blocks. It's not a full list of the building blocks. I only uh, write down four of them. The first is entity. Entity means uh, it has an ID. You can get the entity by its ID. <coughs> identifier. The value object 
Oh, the, uh, for example, you have a user. The user can be fetched by user ID, but value object does not have ID. Like you have the <coughs> geolocation. You have latitude, you have longitude, but you, the, it does not have an ID, and you do not care about the ID as well. You never fetch a location by uh, ID. It's usually nested into an identity. The repository, mm, actually, I do not fully understand repository yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, from what I understand, is that uh, uh, it's a collection of the same entity. If you program it in Java uh, Spring Data, you will find out there is a layer called the repository. It all works with the same entity. Okay. So next is aggregate. Aggregate means uh, an object that can contains different types of entity and value object. So on the right side, you can see in our development world. We have database, we have data access uh, object, or we can use it as a repository. We have service layer and controller. Usually, uh, the aggregate happens on service or controller level. I believe most of them, or most of you already have done this. So here's an example. We have an order delivery, which contains a user address and uh, the ordered items, ordered items, sorry. Here, the uh, order delivery is an aggregate. The order items, address, we do not care about the ID. It's just a simple uh, value object. And a user, we can fetch the user from the user repository or user service, whatever, to get the user by user ID. So the user is an entity. Uh, this uh, terminology, um, I believe it can be used for developers' communication, even usually we do not. Okay. So uh, a few more words about the model. Between domain expert and system designer, the mission is to describe how model works in real world accurately. But among system designers and developers, when we talk about model, the mission is how to implement a robust system that keep data integrity. When we talk about model, we talk about data integrity. <laughs> so for DDD implementation, it usually, it's not usually. You always start with model the domain first. Then you start to design, architect, your API or your SDK, whatever. Then you start to development, refactoring. Uh, it's about implementation. Then you have your model. You have uh, your functions. Now you do the unit testing and the integration test. When you've done this with different subsystems, you have to do continuous integration as well. Once it passes the integration, you can package your tested domain into a module uh, to deploy to uh, to deploy for other references. <coughs> uh, at this stage, you do whatever other implementations. There is new uh, requirements coming. You have to start to re, re redesign your model again. So it always start with model. The model must be tested and uh, provided for the other subsystems to use. This is how it works usually. Okay. However, back to the first slide that uh, DDD is for complex uh, needs because it's very expensive. It's not for everyone. Mm. If you want to keep DDD clean, you have to isolate a lot of domains, or a lot of models. So Microsoft is not recommending DDD for everyone, only for complex uh, needs. So do we still need DDD? Of course, actually, from what I just uh, talked about, DDD have very useful uh, leading concept for us. Like data integrity of what, and the workflow. 
I believe actually we are following it already. Okay. So when we are developing our REST API, which is HTTP based, if, if you uh, use a JSON, you will know JSON does not have a schema naturally. So if you want to keep your model and data integrity, how do you validate your JSON data, right? So why do we need a JSON schema? Because we need reliable JSON. And we need universal dis description language for JSON validation, not language uh, dependent, like you have a library for Java only, an annotation based or whatever. We do not need that. We need something that can, that every developer can understand. So JSON schema is developed to validate JSON input and itself is a JSON object. Here's an example. What this structure tell us? So the schema says we have a JSON titled user. It is an object. It's not a string. It's not a number. And in this object, we need username and user ID. Any one of them is missing is invalid. We reject it. It has three properties. For the username, it's a string. The minimal length is six. For the user ID, it's an integer. But notice here, it's not, uh, oh, here, last time line is an integer and the format is, for, of course you can see at a big int. Uh, so with this schema, we can validate data. So left side is the schema and on the other side, you can see because the username is not, uh, there are only three characters, it's not valid. Here for the, um, for the last line, it's not an integer, and this, the format is not correct, so it's not valid. For this one, even it's missing the last line because it's not declared as required, it's valid. So now with, if you have, haven't done this before, on the server side, when you receive the JSON data, you know with this schema defined, you can validate it. Furthermore, when we have a schema, we can describe our data uh, more accurate, uh, more easily. Like on the, on the left side, you do not have a schema and model. You describe your user as a, like, users, every, every object in this list should have uh, the three properties. But on the other side, you can see, because we have modeling our data, we know we have a user, which is exactly uh, has this, this schema. So we can see for this API, we have a list of users. And this user point to this model. So what we should do with the validation? DDD always emphasis on the data integrity. So on the client side, you actually should always validate the request and response. Even you will think about it's uh, optional uh, or there is a performance issue, but you should do it because data is the most important thing. On the server side, actually you must do it even you do not want to do it. Because it's very dangerous to assume the request data conforms to the required schema. And if the dangerous data comes in, it can be passed into database directly without knowing. I'm, saying, I'm not saying in one system, when you have uh, multi systems, you have multi databases, you just don't know which one will broke. And the data, if they pass from one system to another system, you, you cannot fix it at all. So there, it's too risky. So you must validate the request data. Even with the validation, we have other validation rules, like the conditional logic. Like if the user is an admin, then you have to contain something, some properties. If it's a user has been rejected, uh, like suspended, uh, you must contain something. But for this, schema cannot help you. 
The only thing you can do is to consider split your de design, split on, uh, on conditional schema, split into multi APIs. Like for admin, you have a, a uh, you have a uh, schema, and for other type of users, you have other APIs. This is um, just a suggestion. Uh, I don't think it can apply to all the APIs. Okay, so when we're talking about microservice and now how we can use it with DDD. What is microservice? A microservice is a piece of application functionality factored out into its own code database, speaking to other microservices over a standard protocol. So here, microservices logically has its own code base, team, database. There is no way one microservice access database uh, of the other teams. You can only talk to them by interface or by API call. The standard protocol uh, could be JSON, could be, uh, could be HTTP, could be RPC, could be anything you want, as long as it works. Here's an example like I downloaded from the website. <laughs> so you have the mobile app, you have browser. Here you have the API gateway. You have a website. The two consumers consume API from the microservices, split it into its own database and code base. Actually, the, this can be more complicated because the, the service itself can can call API from each other. This is a simple one, yeah. And you can see the advantage here. So what's the problems? With microservices, not like before you have one big code base, if you change an object, actually you can detect it immediately. If you, have, if you use something like Java, of course not JavaScript. If you use Java, the compiler will tell you the model has been changed, your API is not working anymore. But here, you split into different modules, so if the other module changes the model, you have no idea that it has changed. The, the data comes in as an old version of the data. Now, you cannot uh, decentralize into the object. The system is broke. I copied this picture from another speech. <laughs> so you can see we have different systems, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, if E is not functional, it blocks model integrity. Or C and F, you can see the messages from, a, uh, from E to A is actually broken, but A, cannot, a didn't do anything without it, with it. On the bottom, the AC means uh, anti-corruption. Uh, on the bottom, for some of systems, it implements the anti-corruption layer, which, could, which uh, convert from uh, one format to its own format. If you implement this, this, can, this, this is actually a pattern it can help you solve some of the problems. But you can see, you, you understand what I mean. Here's a few strategies we can use. First is shared kernel. When we talk about uh, a client in accounting service, and, oh sorry, both <laughs> accounting service. Okay, think, think about uh, another service, like building service, they have something shared, like the username, user ID. If, if you want to se separate uh, the object completely, that means you have to save the duplicated data in different database. Uh, it can work sometimes, but in most cases, we'd like to have an upper stream model. So when you create the sub model, you have to validate against the upper stream model first. You, you have to always confirm to the upper stream model. 
then you can uh, extend the object or use other method to extend to uh, implement your, your own logic. This is one design strategy. Another is what I just mentioned. For each subsystem, you create an anti-corruption layer, add an ad adapter, accept objects that confirms to upstream schema, but convert into its own format. Why do you do this? Because it's very easy to do the uh, unit test. So with the data samples, because uh, if the, anyone changes change the data schema, they have to provide it testable data samples for unit test. So you use the data to test against your own format or your own adapter, you will find out the problem immediately. Now, why continuous integration is important? Because you don't know when, you don't know how a subsystem suddenly give you the wrong data format. So for each change, please run the continuous integration. Oh, <laughs> okay. So next is, we, we have talked about so much about the schema. So we have mod APIs, we have mod systems. Now it comes to how I can find the schemas. How, how do I know which schema I should test against? How do I know uh, which system has changed? Many, uh, I think most of the developers prefer code first. They always code first. Then there is something wrong and come back, we code again. But I, I, I think it's not the best way to do it. You actually should, tr uh, should come out with your spec first. Why? Because you have the spec, you have the interface. Everyone knows you have these changes. They will validate your spec first. And they can feedback immediately. This enable fast iteration. So you will, uh, like I, I have a friend working in a company, he, his colleague is uh, in, in USA, he work here. Every time he finds something wrong with their API, it takes two or three days just for one run. So we need fast integration for microservices, especially for microservices. And when we have the spec, it's a two-way agreement, which means the producer and the consumer both know this, this change has happened. We both agree this is the spec, this is the API we should follow. My, uh, uh, my job is to follow the spec, not, not calling you or email you every day. One strategy to do this is to provide the mocking data. Because actually when you're mocking data, when your mocking data is well designed, you actually cannot tell it's real data or it's a mocking data, right? So when you mock the request response data to, to validate the data structure, you can avoid possible er errors. Also for the clients, the, con the API, API consumers, they actually can find out the problem easily because they usually prefer to apply the data into the UI. Sometimes you have to look at the UI to find out oh, a photo is missing or something is missing. Yeah. To do this, uh, after working this, you have to come out with spec, which is actually you know the schema and the document. Then both we consumer and producer agree with it, we can start to code. Because now we know if my code work with the spec, it's not my problem anymore. <laughs> Yeah, the spec becomes the standard to evaluate server and client side, a client developer's responsibility. It's a both, it's a two-way agreement. Okay, so for REST API, we have uh, the open API. I, how many of you have heard about the Swagger? Yeah, I think many of you already heard about that. <laughs> it's also called open API. Uh, itself, it, uh, it, it's actually a JSON schema itself. So beyond the model, you create model, you also can create this, uh, the API with the same JSON schema. Here's an example. I'm using the YAML format because the screen is too small. 
So on the left side, you can see when you describe an endpoint, the, U <laughs> the URL is passed. The message is get. It produces application JSON. The response should, uh, status code should be 2, uh, 200. The result is a list of paths. The schema should be an array of paths. The paths is defined still using the JSON schema uh, as I just described. So here, we wrap up. Everything is about maintain data and model integrity. Validate your input and output always. And spec first, try to come up with a mocking data and make it work first. And consider open spec, open API spec for REST API. I think that's about it for the speech. <laughs> Any questions? I have to So my experience in my development microservice, so we have to achieve the low coupling and high completion. Don't couple and I couple So, so when you design the whole system, uh, I think it's uh, not easy to define uh, define the complex boundary. So you see, how many service in your system? So, as your uh, example, the accounting. So, uh, example. In your system, you have login, you have do uh, A business, B e business, many business. So when you design the whole system, how can you uh, design the, the, I mean the different domain? Uh, how do you decide uh, how many service in your whole system? That's quite that's a very general question. Yeah. I think actually we have to look into the requirements first because you are talking about different uh, systems, different uh, type of vendors or what clients. Yeah. Client. So you have to. And also, uh, uh, between the service, there's a dependency between the service. Right? Yes, it's it can be very complicated. So, uh, considering the performance, uh, you have to sometimes maybe combine two, two services into one service. <laughs> uh, it's very hard to answer this without looking at it. But uh, I think, for example, there are different patterns for that, like uh, factory. If you are talking about the create object, because you have different types of object, you consider in different objects they have something in common. So you want to design your database to for performance or whatever. You should centralize your model creator, like make it its own uh, service. It's it's called a factory pattern. But I'm I'm not sure I can answer the rest of your questions right now. <laughs> so uh, let me pick that up. So the funny thing about domain-driven design is that you need to become a domain expert. So you design, a, like say, uh, you design a new system for drug cleaning, not the illegal one. If you want to it. Um, so you you probably spent uh, uh, a few hundred dollars making a pharmacist drunk to uh, interview him. What are they doing? And then you will learn. Okay, there are the vendors and then there is delivery and then there is the verification with the doctor and so by, by learning about the business uh, you will learn what are the objects in the real world and that become your object boundaries. Of course when you push it further then a lot of these objects you initially found will actually be um, a facade to smaller units. But the, the only way to get domain driven design right is become a domain expert. So you create an application where artists can share uh, performance events 
uh, you hang out with an artist. Otherwise, you don't understand what's important. And uh, that's the whole idea, is like I said, that we, when we move out of the do uh, domain we are so cozy with, like tables and rows and objects and all that, and uh, deal with the real life. I recommend the artist one, that's good fun. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Should I start my demo? <laughs> okay. So I was talking about the spec mocking for a reason because I'm going to introduce a product of mine. <laughs> okay. It takes a few minutes. <coughs> Uh, so right now, it's our work is like work, workflow is like always code first. Then we have to deploy, deploy for the consumers to uh, consume. Then we have to finish the document. Then the consumer feedback. If there's some problem, we back to code, deploy, document feedback. It's like a cycle. It could take like days to start a project. However, the problem is we thought uh, our design was a good idea, but we spent days or weeks on the prototype, it turns out it's not working. So if, if only we can prove the idea faster. So what if we can speed up the API development so that the server developer and the client developer can work together at the same time? They start at the same time. We do not have to wait for the API to Start set up. So what REST Studio does is actually it enables you to design, deploy, and document REST API seamlessly in a few minutes without coding. So you only design, you do not code. So like what I said, you design the spec, you make sure it works, then you start to work to code. So REST Studio contains a few modules, uh, modeling tools document tools, request executor. You can think about Postman. And is, there is a smart mock server. It takes like one minute to start your project. Like one minute to, to create your endpoint. One minute to update your mock re, re, uh, request and response. And that's it. And by the end of the five minutes, you have a live mock server. You have Swagger compatible documentation, and you have a powerful API explorer. Uh, demo. <laughs> okay. Wait. I'm not sure this works or not. Okay. It's very simple. Uh, like, we want to create a blog API. It's uh, JSON. So request, accept, and response is JSON. We assume that our code will run in our local host. Then it's created. Now you want to create uh, your endpoint first. There is a CIUD creator. You provide the uh, path, the ID name, and also the object name. Okay. It enables you to create your API email, uh, with, with one click. So now I want to uh, bring up the server. Here you can enable the cloud sync. Uh oh, oh okay. <laughs> With this, uh, crossing is enabled. Everyone can access it with the ID. Then you have your mock server to create the environment. The environment is, should be set as default environment. You can see you have a global variables. Now back to the, you can run it already. It's online, it's live. But, oh, it's too slow. But it's not found because you haven't pushed your mock data yet. You haven't defined it. 
So you want to define your mock data. Here's a data like uh, when we create a blog, it should have a status success. We all agree with that, right? Then we should return at least the blog ID, right? You can generate the schema. Both you can label it as required. You upload mocking responses back to your executor. It's live. You can access from your mobile, whatever, with this base URL and this. Now you want to uh, construct your request data, like title, the first block, content, hello world. Uh, you can save, oh sorry, first day first. Then you have the data. Remember what I said, next step is schema. So you go to schema editor, extract data from the uh, request, generate its schema, label it as required, you upload it. Now, remember the content is required. If I delete it, I run it. The mock server actually tells you missing properties. The mock data, so the mock server can detect your errors. Of course, if you do not want to do it on the uh, server side, you can validate it on the client side as well. With this, and you can also ve uh, preview your request if there is something wrong. Uh, to demo a bit more about this, I, I make it back first. Make sure it works, yes. So now I want to say the title must be the minimum length is like 32. You upload your mocking responses. Now you go and try again. It tells you it's too short. Fails to validate that. Yeah. So, oh, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> uh, you also can uh, simulate different types of status code. Like if you do not want 200, you want 201, you create a 201, like created, true. But as you can see, the default is 200. You can trigger the 201 in uh, the query. Eh? Oh. Mm, I'm not sure it's enough or not. Okay, so this is 201 and create is true. And if you disable this parameter, it returns a default response. That's why I called it smart. Uh, although it's not smart enough for me. <laughs> All right, now we have, we have a, a API Explorer, a live uh, mock server, you have the document here. This is what your API consumer will see. They have the tags, all the required types, descriptions, examples. Actually, this is um, a Swagger compatible. So later on, it's still under development, so you can export as a Swagger project. You use that, you can generate your server and client-side SDK. And also, there are a lot of open source tools for Swagger. That means you can edit here, and you can do whatever Swagger can do as well. Yeah. So last, I will demo the cloud scene. Right now, it's um, I copy this value, then go to, we assume this is, um, Another user. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> oh, I haven't published yet. Sorry. <laughs> I have to uh, publish. Yeah. 
the design follows that you have to commit with uh, change log. So everyone knows what you have changed. You have to do that. It's not a sync automatically without knowing what has been changed. It's a bit slow. OK, it's here. So for API consumers, they can change and do whatever. Their request will be validated on the server side. Why is it so slow? OK, it works. This is what they see. Um, the last one, I want to demo the import swagger. This one is actually from the, edi uh, the Swagger editor. They have different examples. So you can see, I'm not sure you have used it or not, but the network is too slow, so I'm not going to load it. This is the definition of a Swagger project. It's very long. Okay. See, it's here. You can actually execute it. That's it. So what it does, it enables you to start your project and finish your prototype and validate your request response very quickly without coding. Then the, the spec is here. You can do whatever based on the spec. That's for this one. And this is, right now it's in alpha stage, and it's going to uh, be beta in like two or three weeks. Right now we still have a few breaking changes ongoing. <laughs> yeah, that's it for today. I'm going to publish this URL later in the Slack group. Yeah, so everyone can try it, try it out. Let me know. Is this your startup? Yes. <laughs> I hope it can start up. <laughs> huh? Hopefully, yes. Okay. You have questions? Exactly. That's what that's what I call conditional right? So you have the same object, but actually they are conditional. If this is uh, like yeah, 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 right. So you you have to decide what which way to go. You can use the same one, but the required one could be wrong. And some some logic is conditional. It, it is correct in this condition, but it's not correct on the other condition. So if you want to make uh, make the unconditional schema, you have to separate them. Yeah, and you have to separate the API as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how it works. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs>